Hello, good evening. I'm so glad you could join us for this very spe special lecture. Um, I was really thrilled when Charlie Brock agreed to come all the way out from Washington, D.C. Uh, to visit with us to do this um, for us because I haven't seen Charlie for 24 years. <laughs> so it's been a real pleasure to get back in touch with him and to just listen to him talk about painting. He's a really wonderful uh, speaker and he has a sensitivity to painting that's very rare. And certainly this artist is near and dear to his heart because he did a very large exhibition and uh, produced an incredible catalog, uh, 15 copies of which we actually have in our store, and he will sign them for you if you decide you want to purchase one of these catalogs. They are out of print, so I would encourage you to do so. That'll follow directly after our lecture. Um, but, you know, Charlie is also very well known as uh, an Americanist who's worked both uh, on American art, but also on British art, which he's responsible for at the National Gallery. And I'm really uh, so thrilled to learn, too, that at the National Gallery, they're doing more collaborative uh, interdepartmental exhibitions. And he's been working with uh, the photography curator. So that's a very rich and generative relationship that didn't used to exist, at least when I was at the National Gallery. I don't know, Larry, if you remember there ever even being a photography department back then. Um, but he's at, uh, currently working on a really fascinating show that's uh, devoted to Whistler's Symphony in White. So we'll look forward to seeing uh, uh, the fruition of that uh, intense exchange that he's having right now with a number of curators at the National Gallery, in including our dear friend Mary Morton. Um, but tonight he's going to address uh, snow because it is the theme of our current temporary exhibition, which, as you know, is drawn from our permanent collection and does feature uh, the great masterpiece that we have by Bellows in the collection, uh, Steaming Streets. And I think it's going to be a real delight to hear him delve into his uh, one of his favorite topics. Um, so please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. thank you, Ike. And uh, thank you, uh, Ashley, and uh, everyone here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. For the unusual opportunity, how could I pass up this invitation <laughs> to speak about snow uh, two, week, two weeks before Christmas in Southern California? It, it, I mean, it had a kind of surrealist uh, edge to it. So uh, no, it's been so it's been such a pleasure to be here the last couple of days, and uh, uh, we, uh, me and my wife Carolina, really uh, really appreciate your hospitality, Ike, and and uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, so let us begin. Um, in his quest to live up to his teacher, Robert Henry's philosophy of art for life's sake versus not art for art's sake, George Bellows realized that his work had to be more than just imitative, that he had to prove that the act of painting was as vital as the act of living. Bellows sought to capture not only the visual reality of what he saw, but how he experienced it how it felt. In equating the substance of winter, snow, and ice with the substance of paint, it was not only what he painted, but the act of painting that would count. The, vis the visual and the viscera, and the visceral. Like all great painters, Bellows loved the reality of paint. As the American art historian John Wilmerding wrote, paint in his hands seems to have a plastic density and mass that give almost a sensuosity to both textures and volumes in his paintings. Rather than the more iconic boxing scenes, I'll be talking tonight about how Bellows strove to encompass the life of the great modern metropolis of New York in his equally and in some ways even more ambitious winter views. This is a topic that can't readily be covered in the time we have, but nonetheless, I'm going to give it a try, even if I ramble a bit, which, which believe me, I, I will. I'm going to, once I get past this introduction. <laughs> if nothing else, I hope you'll enjoy taking a closer look at the series of stunning paintings from the period 1907 to 1915 that Bellows devoted 
to winter along the Hudson and East Rivers around Manhattan, as well as in the enclave of Zion, New Jersey. Among these is, of course, the fantastic steaming streets, streets here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, which I had the great pleasure of spending some time with yesterday with a number of you. Um, in addition to the catalog for the 19, 2012 retrospective organized by the National Gallery of Art, my talk draws heavily on two sources that I recommend to you. George Bellows' Love of Winter by David Setford and John Wilmerding, published in 1997, and Michael Quick, The Paintings of George Bellows, 1992. My presentation will be roughly organized into three parts. I'll start with a brief overview of Bellows' career. I'll then um, survey the winter paintings, of which there are about 25 or so, before concluding with a few thoughts about the nature of Bellows' artistic enterprise as it is reflected in his winter scenes. Let's begin, begin with Bellows' biography. George Bellows was born in Columbus, Ohio in August 1882 and demonstrated a facility for drawing as a young boy. In high school, he also became an accomplished baseball, basketball, and football player, sports which he continued to excel in after enrolling at Ohio State University in 1901. The dual per persona of artist and athlete, observer and performer that Bellows established in these early years later become, became integral to his popular fame and public persona. In spring 1904, Bellows withdrew from Ohio State and moved to New York, where he attended William Merritt Chase's New York School of Art and studied with Robert Henry, who became his lifelong friend and mentor. In 1908, Henry had organized an exhibition of the eight, a group of painters who, in opposition to the Conservative National Academy, dedicated themselves to painting, all, to painting all aspects of contemporary life and all levels of society in a variety of styles. Bellows, while not a member of the eight, nevertheless became closely associated with them and a later group of urban realists known as the Ashcan School for their gritty scenes of urban life. Bellows quickly established a reputation as one of the most promising artists of his generation and in 1909 was elected one of the youngest elected as an associate member of the National Academy of Design. In 1910, he moved into a townhouse at 146 East 19th Street near Gramercy Park in Manhattan and married Emma Story, a fellow art student he had first met in 1904. He lived and worked at that address for the rest of his life. This is very much a New York story. So if there are New Yorkers out there, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of these addresses and places, of course. Bellows was actively involved with the famous 1913 Armory Show, a display of over 1,000 American and European modernist works. He exhibited a group of his paintings and drawings and attended the show regularly and actually helped to install it. That same year, he also began contributing illustrations to the socialist magazine, The Masses, and in 1916 began devoting much of his time to lithography. During the summer of 1917, he traveled to Carmel, California and Santa Fe, New Mexico, a point I can't miss making here, um, and in 1918, in, in 1918, returning to the theme of human violence found in his early boxing images, Bellas created a large group of paintings, drawings, and lithographs depicting German atrocities in Belgium in World War I. Some of these works served to advertise the U.S. government's liberty bond drive in support of America's entry into the war. In the summer of 1920, Bellows, the Bellows family visited rural Woodstock, New York, where Bellows built a home and studio in 1922. On January 2nd, 1925, Bellows suffered a ruptured appendix and died suddenly six days later of peritonitis. He was only 42 years old. This is a crucial point about Bellows. He, he could have lived into the 1960s, which many of his contemporaries did. And because he died young, he's been a little bit disassociated from his own uh, generation and more so associated with the older generation of Henry and Sloan, an artist uh, who he revered and learned from, but he was a, really a student of. Um, at the time of his death, Bellows was one of the most successful, 
Um, that fall, he was honored with the memorial exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. At the time of his death, Bellas was one of the most successful and highly regarded artists in America. However, his popular reputation soon became based almost exclusively on his boxing pictures. And by the end of the century, though he was still widely known and, and well appreciated, his reputation had been surpassed by that of his classmate, friend, and colleague, an artist who had gained very little reputation during uh, when Bellows was alive, Edward Hopper. It was almost as though they, are, they have a very interesting relationship there. Bellows was a, was a very introverted, uh, laconic individual. Bellows was a complete extrovert and, 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 and someone who, um, in some ways, completely eclipsed Hopper over the first uh, part of Hopper's life. So they have a, a very interesting dynamic uh, between them. Reflecting on his life, Bellows wrote, I arose surrounded by Methodists and Republicans. My mother wished me to be a bishop. My father planned for me to become president of a bank. By sheer luck, I found myself in my first art school under Robert Henry, never having heard of him before. I had every equipment except all the essentials. My brains were as innocent as a college could make them. My life begins at, the, at this point, the rest is legend. Henry challenged young artists to embrace and experience all aspects of contemporary life as they found it on the streets of New York. He wanted his students to develop their own styles based on their individual responses to what they saw. He encouraged them to roam the city to gather material for their canvases. Draw your material from the life around you, from all of it. There is beauty in everything if it looks beautiful to your eyes. You can find it anywhere, everywhere. Like 19th century predecessors such as Dickens and Whistler in London and Baudelaire and Manet in Paris, Henry encouraged American artists to be keen observers of urban life, or as he put it, sketch hunters. Echoing Henry's disdain for the status quo and, and academic traditions, Bellows observed, it is immoral to blurt out a witty idea in half an hour of expressing oneself with a paintbrush, but quite moral to labor six months and say nothing. Painting which presents the cruelty of life, such as his boxing pictures, is a horror to smug individuals, and believe me, the academy is full of them. And this was a shocking picture when it was shown. It was never sold during his lifetime. It gained, it gained him notoriety, but it, 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 it's still a brutal, a brutal picture. No one threw himself into Henry's project of art for life's sake more completely than Bellows. His art subsumed every type of human desire as he sought to capture New York street life in all of its chaos and diversity. As Bellows put it, I am always very amused with people who talk about lack of subjects for painting. The great difficulty is that you cannot stop to sort them out enough. Wherever you go, they are waiting for you. The audacity of Bella's ambition can be measured by a comparison to the radical experiments of another prodigy and his exact contemporary, Pablo Picasso, in another urban center, Paris. The two artists were both born in 1882. Their early masterpieces were shocking and broke with many of the pieties of the Victorian era. Both members of this club is a depiction of a brutal illegal event featuring naked male aggression that incorporates the multiple perspectives of a theater in the round. Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is a brothel scene of provocative female sexuality that deploys a fragmented proto-cubist armature. So now I'll begin this survey. And there are a lot of paintings here. And I'll, I'll try to um, keep this as organized as I can. Um, our, sur our survey at the winter scenes begins with a group of startling urban views. Bellow's urban winter scenes, like his urban boxing paintings, embraced modern realities. Both were part of an effort to embrace the totality of experience available to Bellows in the most modern of modern cities, New York. 
As Ike's wonderful show, Let It Snow, demonstrates, snow can be serene and beautiful, but it can also be chaotic and messy. And a struggle to navigate. Bellows clearly preferred the latter. For Bellows, it was in that messy struggle that he found the, uh, to, to, to paint this, best, this complicated scene, he found this, this life source. Um, for Bellows, the que uh, I'm sorry, um, getting a little lost here. Uh, for Bellows, the question was, how do you create an art that rivals the vivid, chaotic qualities of life itself? How do, you, how do you create an art that is alive? How do you capture life? Bellows believed you immersed yourself in the chaos. You struggled to paint it. You put yourself in the middle of the ring, the eye of the storm. Uh, that is where most, life, most of that life can be found. And um, interestingly, one of the interesting things we were talking about yesterday was there is actually this small dot of white at the center of this picture, which I think is right, is that right, Ike, right in here? And, and that is kind of where Bellows, this, it's, it, it's, you, you'll see this again and again in these pictures. Where, where, it's really as though he is trying to, to, to point or to kind of, uh, to um, place himself in the center of these chaotic scenes. And there's this enigmatic little dot of white that seems to indicate the kind of center of this maelstrom of action that's taking place in steaming uh, streets. So that's what Bellows, this, this is something that he's striving for. It's actually hard to articulate, but I think you feel it in his paintings that he's really trying to get not only the literal sense of what's going on, but what is the source of this life and, and energy that he's uh, confronting. Um, unlike, um, interestingly, so how did, he, how did he go about doing this? Um, you might think that because of the, the palpable reality of this scene, that like the Impressionist, uh, like Alfred Stieglitz, he literally was painting out of doors, painting, you know, taking his uh, painting equipment uh, and doing these things directly from experience. As, as Stieglitz in this remarkable, he actually was of course taking his camera out into the snow as a technical challenge to capture this, uh, this type of scene. But actually with Bellows, that is not what was going on. With Bellows, and this is something that his teacher Henry had really uh, taught him, it was, it, was, it was a different type of process. Um, as we proceed, let's keep uh, in mind an observation by Bellows' friend and fellow artist, uh, Eugene Spiker. Quote, we took many walks up and down the Hudson, through the Bowery and Lower East Side, down around the docks and Brooklyn Bridge. I was always astonished by his vivid memory. He would paint his impressions of these walks and fill the canvases with data which had a special flavor or character. He seldom, if ever, used models or even made drawings for these pictures. So he is working from memory in his studio to create these works. And I want I to draw, I want to also bring uh, two quotes to your attention, and also this remarkable book, which I, is, if you are ever feeling you've lost your inspiration or your love of art, I recommend Robert Henry's The Art Spirit. It's, he, it, it reflects what a tremendous and, and really charismatic teacher he must have been to this whole generation of artists, including Bellows. But he speaks directly to um, this technique, the sketch hunter's technique. And he does it so beautifully. <laughs> this is worth it. <laughs> this, is, this is much more eloquent than anything else, of course, you'll, I'll say. But the sketch, hunter has, the sketch hunter has delightful days of drifting about among people, in and out of the city, going anywhere, everywhere, stopping as long as he likes, no need to reach any point, moving in any direction, following the call of interest he moves through life as he finds it, not passing negligently the things he loves, but stopping to know them and to note them down in the shorthand of his sketchbook, 
a box of oils with a few small panels, the fit of his pocket, or in his drawing pad. Like any hunter, he hits or misses. He is looking for what he loves. He tries to capture it. It's found anywhere, everywhere. Those who are not hunters do not see these things. The hunter is learning to see and to understand, to enjoy. There are memories of days of this sort, of wonderful driftings in and out of the crowd, of seeing and thinking, where are the sketches that are made, that were made. Some of them are in dusty piles. Some turned out to be so good they got frames. Some, some became motives for big pictures, which were either better or worse than the sketches. But they are, or rather the states of being and understandings we had at the time of doing them, all are sifting through and leaving their impress on our whole work and life. And then he speaks to this process very directly about, about memory and how this, need, this is really how you get a hold of, of life in art. It's not this, again, this, um, this, cap, this just simple copying of what's happening directly in, in front of you at the time. The most vital things in the look of a face or of a landscape endure only for a moment. Work should be done from memory. The memory is of that vital moment. During that moment, there is a correlation of the factors of that look. This correlation does not continue. New arrangements, greater or less, replace them as mood changes. The special order has to be retained in memory, that special look and that order which was its expression. Memory must hold it. All work done from the subject thereafter must be no more than data gathering. The subject is now in another mood. A new series of relations has been established. They may confound. The memory of that special look must be held, and the subject can now only serve as an indifferent mannequin of its former self. The picture must not become a patchwork of parts of various moods. The original mood must be held to. So this is a very difficult and complex process that Bellows is engaged in. And we can never forget that when we're looking at his pictures. Um, Bear with me here. So, so when we look at a picture like this, we're, we're literally diving into a very chaotic scene. And we always have to ask ourselves, what are we actually seeing in Bellow's paintings? Some of his paintings I, I've been looking at for many years, and to this day, there's, issue, there's areas that are confused that all of a sudden resolve themselves. Um, and this picture, I think, we, again, we were discussing yesterday, what is actually going on here? I, I get the, the thought is there's this wonderful turning motion of the horses, but there's, there's also this, again, this total immersion in this totally, uh, you wouldn't want to be what, doing what this guy's doing in the middle of the street. It's also coming right at you. So there's a bit of a, of a like, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's like literally en engaging you head on. But the, it's interesting, this turn of the horses, the fact that the guy is kind of holding a halter. And what I think is happening, and the streetcar is behind, there, it, and, and at this time, when this was painted, there were still streetcars being pulled by horses. By 1917, they were gone. And the Alfred Stieglitz photograph is 1893 when they were still prevalent. But I think that this is a turning point where the, the, everything is being turned around. They'll reconnect the, the, uh, the streetcar behind the horses and then move back up the avenue. And the children, again, rather precariously on the bottom edge there, um, and with the, with the, uh, they're being held back. I think this group is waiting to be picked up. I think that they're, they're at this terminal. And there's actually a photograph by Stieglitz from 1893 that tells us a little bit more about what's going on there. 
but you'll see this it's basically so interesting with bellows because you know on the one hand this is a perfect a perfect conundrum because the, you what is the relationship of these horses to this carriage it's it's it also strikes at deeper themes what is the relationship of old ways of moving to new ways of moving it's like a it's a crossroads of all these modes of transportation uh, intersections between people and he dives in there and he again working from memory and how much is he you know just how much is he pulling out of that experience and what's amazing is how much he is pulling out of that experience because he also of course gets the wonderful envelop this notion of this of of, of uh, winter enveloping this scene but there's you'll you'll find again and again that he returns to certain motifs as Basically, you're, what you're seeing in this picture is what you will continue throughout all of these winter scenes. He dives in very deep into this deep space. It's, it's obscured by, by, the, by the snow, by the smoke. Um, and, and there's little pieces, little uh, identifiable pieces. The two horses we'll see again and again. We'll see the streetcars advertising. We'll see this. This is actually a crane up here, which we'll see in other pictures. We'll see the groupings of children. The, and, and this, so there, there's different little pieces of this that he'll rework in variation after variation. But we're always left with a bit of uncertainty about what is going on. And this drives a lot of New Yorkers crazy because they're like, where, I know where this is. I know, you know, they, they really want to believe and there is an element of that, real, that reality is there, that, that actual specific element. But it's, 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 it's everywhere and nowhere. And of course, it's more the way we actually experience, this is where the reality, this is the reality of the way we experience the world. We obviously don't capture it in a single frame. We're confused, we move through it in a, you know, in a state of chaos. And so this, in a way, this way of painting, as I think Henry was trying to get it, is really truer to experience. And therefore, it really engages. It's a very, it's, a, it's unsettling because it really, uh, you know, you're in a very chaotic situation, but it's more like the way we actually experience life itself. And, the, and all those confusions and not being able to figure out what's going on, understanding parts of something, uh, and, and finding your way through, through this kind of chaotic situation is so much really, really true, true to the way we encounter um, and, and experience um, the world. Um, but, but nonetheless, it's, we, you know, I think for Bellows, he was always, there's, there's a disconnect there. You know, he's trying to do this, but it's, it's an almost impossible uh, task, but he keeps trying, and that's his great, great ambition in really all of these paintings. And you're so fortunate to have this <laughs> painting here. It'll, it'll, people will be looking at this for forever and ever. It'll, it'll always be a, a vital interest to anyone interested in uh, painting. And here's another uh, beautiful scene, noon. Again, this deep space, we're diving in, what's going on? Uh, the, the, here's the motif of the, of the white and the dark horse um, with, the, with the rider. Uh, what, is, what is the smoke? That the L train, the elevated train, what is, you know, again, that these, these uh, uh, um, pipes, um, drainage pipes perhaps? There's some type of construction going on here. Um, so we have a, it's a, again, we're, we're, we're like plunging into this deep, uh, complex space. And I think what's happening here is this is the train stop. The elevated train is above here. And you can begin to see that people are coming down, I think, out of this train station, out onto the street. And there again, you have this crowd, uh, which is similar to the crowd of children at the bottom of the left of the first picture. And on top of that, you, get, you begin to see Bellows, you know, that he creates a structure, beautiful, uh, he takes advantage of the freedom of working this way by also being able to create these wonderful geometric structures that of course correspond not to uh, exact reality, but he can make them, you know, create these very interesting ways of, of dividing the canvas here with the, with the structure of the elevated train. 
um, the mystery of seeing this smoke and what's going on. You'll see this again and again. He uses smoke to kind of raise the question, what is this? It's like a question mark, but it's also incredibly painterly, incredibly beautiful. And then, of course, he also uses this, uh, he's a master of blue, blue on blue painting, blue painting. Of course, Picasso had his blue period. But Bella, interestingly enough, really was, did some remarkable, uh, was a remarkable master of, 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 of blue tonalities. So he, he begins to, it gives him the freedom to, to attend to the literal, to pick it out, but to also to, to completely wrap it up in the process of actually um, making, uh, making a picture. Um, so this, this is his, his obsession. Um, and, it, and again, it's, what's, it's remarkable when you see how similar all these visions of the winter uh, scenes are. And you realize there is something um, driving all of them. So this, this, uh, And now we turn to the four, uh, this remarkable series of paintings um, devoted to the construction of the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Station in New York uh, in, in 1907, 1908. This was a massive eight acre hole in the ground for the, for the original Penn Station, which was torn, McKinn Mead, Mead White structure that was torn down in the 1960s and actually spurred the, uh, the conservation, uh, the uh, historical preservation movement in New York, it was such a travesty. But, but Bellows, so Bellows, as many New Yorkers, this completely disrupted the city. It tore into the literal fabric, into like the geological underpinnings of the city. And this was, this is the Bellows subject. Again, we're diving in to a kind of large, indeterminate space. We know, we kind of know where we are, but you know, again, no one would have actually experienced this exact point of view walking around this enormous hole in the ground. It's a place where two, the two train tunnels underneath the Hudson are eventually will come up and uh, into this, uh, into, into Pennsylvania Station here. But you have a lot of the same, um, the, the smoke from the engines, um, and, and what we'll see again and again is even these, these buildings, the kind of skyline you see here, we'll see this type of, type of um, composition reflected in his views uh, of the Palisades along the Hudson River. Again, we have this deep dive and then this, um, this kind of cliff face both of, of, the, of the earth but also of buildings. And, and, um, and then you go down into the, and you see the, the, you have the, um, the train cutting through this. You have these kind of figures here on the cliff, this rather um, precarious situation here. Um, and it's all, it's all uh, folded into this kind of beautiful gray on gray, white on white painting, which of course is one of the great things about snow. We were discussing yesterday with the group that I was with, like what, what makes snow so appealing to an artist? And of course it's this kind of, this, it's the way the world becomes a totally visual experience that's tied together by grays and whites. And, and so it has that very aesthetic quality to it. But, but Bellas is also interested in this, as I say, this other aspect about the way it totally, totally disrupts our lives. It, it totally, it's a, it's a point in time when nature really rules and it, it, and it is treacherous. And, and he's always interested in working, he's very often interested in working people and their, and their plight, their, their labor in this very, under these very um, difficult circumstances. But again, this is, there's something heroic, uh, uh, full of uh, true energy, vitality, um, and you know, that they're constructing this massive building. These little, these men, these workers, many of whom died, uh, during the construction of Penn Station. This is a very, so B Bellows is getting at the currency. This is modern, this is the new train station. At the same time, he's, con he's really getting down to the depths of where is this, literally, where is this coming from? What is generating this building? You know, what is it that really animates us? Uh, and he's tying that to painting. He's saying the painting is, I'm pushing that paint around like these guys are moving that snow around or they're digging up that earth. There's something analogous to my work as a painter and the work, the work that's being done in settings like this. And it's a very, um, I think it's, it's appreciated with Bellas, but it's a very compelling accomplishment that um, I think we're, even today, I don't know if we truly appreciate how innovative these paintings are. And I should say he's not even, he's not even 30 years old when he's doing these paintings. He's clearly one of the, he's one of these phenomena in New York where he comes to New York and um, I'll make the analogy to someone like Bob Dylan. 
where he comes to New York and all of a sudden everything, he, everything, he absorbs everything and almost immediately um, starts creating works that you can't quite understand how a person who's just at the beginning of his career, this is 1907, he's still in school. And, and a lot of these are being driven by Henry's assignments. There's other artists that are used to go out and paint, you know, this. And, and Bellows is just doing it at a scale beyond anything that even Henry could have conceived. And the, these, they're such an unusual pictures, the um, excavation sites. This is the National Gallery's Blue Morning. Again, it, instead of focusing on the, on the iconic, finished, beautiful um, train station in the back, he's, we're, ba we're down in the pit. We're down with the cranes, we're down with the workmen, we're down with, with this rickety fence. And, and the question is, how do we get from these single, this is a guy wielding a hammer at the top of some, again, what is going on here? Are they breaking apart some type of rock? But you know, the fact that he ties this single gesture, it's almost like that dot of white of this guy wielding a hammer against, how does, how does this, the station, this massive, brilliant thing come out of the day, you know, this, all of these single hammer blows of these, of these, of these uh, anonymous uh, workmen in this pit. Um, and that, that's, that's, the, that's the scope. And that's, um, that's why we care about Bellows. And that, that's why he, uh, again, you can criticize, in a way you can criticize that ambition as maybe being too much, but he accomplishes so much in the trying of it, the effort of it. And of course, this is what's so beautiful. The beautiful thing about this painting is, it, is, it, is it that it is poised perfectly. And by the way, here's the elevated train again, framing this in such a beautiful, interesting way. Um, he, he weds this, this is, a, you know, he gets everything about Impressionism. It's light, atmosphere. It's, it really is a blue, that beautiful blue morning light. And yet he ties it to this really gritty um, urban subject matter. And so with Bellows, again, it's like, how much can I do? You know, how much can I learn? And, and, he, and he's so open to all of it, uh, and obviously has this uh, tremendous uh, uh, energy. Um, excavation at night. Here he combines two, the, the beauty of the nocturne for a painter, the, the beauty of painting dark, darkness, the, the, the challenge of it, the kind of pure visual, uh, excitement of it, challenge of it, with the painting of snow, the painting of pure white. Um, and he um, noted at this, and here we get this idea of the center of interest, this is Bellows, noted, this was the best attempt I have made to locate the center of interest by strong light. Those tenement houses behind the excavation always gave me the creeps. But again, it's that, you know, he's searching for some way to hold all of this strange uh, imagery in his mind on, on, and hold it onto a, a canvas like this. And this is um, Pennsylvania Station Excavation 1909. And again, we've got the railroad. We've got all the, um, the railroad line. Um, We've got the, the figures precariously on the cliff here. We can read again. We, we you could spend we could spend you know the whole, whole hour on each of these paintings. What what you know? Let's what are we? What's what are, what are these gestures? What are these poses? They all actually cohere. And what's so startling about this is this beautiful uh, orange blue combination. And it, it and of course we've got it's it's uh, these evocations of smoke and snow and. Uh, but, but he talked about, um, here Bellows wrote of this painting, great dignified masses can just as well be made or better often be made with powerful color as with grays. Would you like to see Whistler's reserve in fine oranges and blues? It can be done. He was very interested in color theory. So he starts from this, you know, he's gonna do anything he can to recapture that experience. And so this is where he says, I'm interested in everything to do about life and about art. He's interested in a huge range of color theories that come out, some of them the French 19th century traditions that fueled Impressionist paintings, uh, the, kind of the idea of putting complementary colors side by side to make them more vivid. 
um, comes out of Chevrolet, was very who was a theorist who was very influ influential with the Impressionists, but Bellows was also very up to date with the color theories of a man named Hardesti, Hardesti Marada, who had, uh, we'll see a little bit more of in a, in a, in a, in a bit, incredibly uh, and complicated um, uh, color system. So there's an intellectual side um, uh, to Bellows uh, too. Um, and that, again, I think is all part of this kind of all-encompassing what, what, can, what can you, uh, how much can you pour into, into a, to a single work. And this, of course, is the great summary scene of, of Midtown Manhattan. Instead of like digging out that chunk of Penn Station, it's like, I'm going to show you this crowded square. But the immensity of the space is the same. The inability to define where it is is the same. It's actually, uh, a, you know, it's, it's essentially a composite of Madison Square at the intersection of Broadway and 23rd Street Midtown, but it's not. It's not that exact address. It's basically everything that you can imagine. It's called New York. <laughs> That's what it is. It's not, it's not a street. It's literally New York. This is like a New York story. I mean, he, that's, that's his ambition. His ambition is to wrap his, uh, is, to, is to paint the modern city in every dimension. It, and really, think if you set yourself that task. I mean, really, and really seriously went, went about trying to accomplish, accomplish it. So you, again, you have the, the different elements, the elevated train here, the trolleys here, the horse-drawn carriages here, uh, the policemen, the snow digger, uh, the, the, the street cleaners here. I mean, this is truly mind-boggling. And this is at the National Gallery, and this truly is a painting where I'm like, what? I never knew. <laughs> you know, you're always picking up on strange things about this painting. And, the, and, these, and there's a lot of interaction between, um, between people in the painting um, that, that will come out over time. So that you think, oh, I don't, I'm not, I don't, this doesn't make any sense, but it actually does. And, and you have this, in the, in the heart of this painting actually is this winter scene of a park covered with snow. So it is very much a winter scene. Um, and then Bellas does this funny trick of, you know, you, these, these signs are kind of legible, but they're not. So it's like you can start to read them and he draws you in, but then you're kind of left floating. You can't actually decipher them. And I think that's where Bellows wants you to leave you. He wants to draw you in and kind of leave you suspended and leave you to your own devices to figure out what is going on, as he was doing and is doing. But it's got these incredible, again, his facility with paint, you know, these hay, hay bales are literally just one, you know, little one single stroke, boom, 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 boom. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a remarkable, remarkable work. It was widely criticized when it was displayed they said this is this is gibberish. Not, you know, the critics really uh, as, they recognized that it was saying something about New York that other artists weren't saying, but it was also criticized because it's breaking all the rules, and it's it's also verging on some. It, it's crowding the scene so intensely that it really pushes everything to the front. It becomes a, a kind of a very close to a pure abstraction. So it's a it's a wonderful uh, again a wonderful instance of this this uh, these urban scenes. But now we're going to. Um, and what I wanted to t talk about also by just showing these aerial maps was this is, in some sense, this is the perspective you're kind of getting in a scene like this. You're getting a kind of, let's do the whole city. But of course, this also orients you to all the places that, that Bellows worked. So you'll see, we'll, we'll see scenes of the, uh, of the battery. We'll see uh, scenes along the Palisades. We'll see scenes uh, uh, with Blackwell's Island and, and the Queensboro Bridge. This is early before Bell, uh, before Bellas is alive, but this. But I also think this notion of encompassing the city is this kind of aerial, comprehensive vision of the city is something. You know, what is the heart? How do you capture a city? How do you how do you capture a city in, in all of its uh, dimensions? Is part of what's going on here. Um, and let me. Okay, and just to, just to orient us a bit as we go forward. Uh, so here's a look at the city's grid in 1880. Many of Bella's winters, winter views look out across the Hudson towards the Palisades from Riverside Park, which is right here, and then it looks out towards the Hudson. Uh, in Bellows Day, Riverside Park stretched, and this is for if there are any New Yorkers, stretched from 88th to 129th, 29th Street, with another area of park started at 155th Street. 
Uh, the tracks of the New York Central and Hudson Railroad hug the shoreline, so you'll see that the train when we look at these upcoming views. And Bellows worked primarily in two locales, between 119th and 129th Street, uh, and between 155th and 177th Street. Uh, and um, so that orients you a bit, but this is a map that is um, contemporary with a lot of the, uh, the paintings. So I'm gonna return, I just, I'm using this as the divider image for a lot of my uh, sections of the talk. Is this, is, are you hearing me all right? Okay, I'm just, okay. So, but I love this idea that, that in, you know, in, in sense, in sense of the scope of his work in some ways is this type of overview, looking as wide as possible across uh, uh, the city. And he, he literally covers from the top to the bottom in, in these views. So it's, it's really, so you'll see, you'll see their scenes near Brooklyn Bridge, Battery Park, Riverside Park, uh, uh, the, the Queensboro Bridge. Um, uh, so it's it, it, the inner city. Um, so it, it really, it, when you put all of these together, you, you do get a really, really rich uh, 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 view of the city. So here, um, turning from the urban, we're, we're gonna be really looking at these, uh, these river scenes. And just to give you, a, I just wanted to point out that, that Bellows kept a detailed record book. So essentially the sequence that I'm showing you here, we have a pretty good idea that this was the sequence in which the paintings were uh, created. Um, in this instance, it's, it's not always accurate, but in this instance, we see that he's also destroyed a major canvas devoted to um, a winter view called the White Hudson. Um, so he was someone, as much as we, he was someone who was always, you know, destroying things, reworking things, painting over things, restretching things, um, and, um, and that again gives this sense of this just ongoing uh, project. And this is the first, um, this is the first um, important river uh, scene. Um, and again, how, how, how similar this is to the excavation pictures. It's, uh, it has a lot of the same structure. You know, looking down, looking out and deep, cliffs, this sense of, a, of a, this huge space. Uh, you, and again, you'll see, what you'll see here is again and again, he's going to, to almost as, he, as a way to anchor this unwieldy project, he has a few motifs, which he always has variations on, but there's the bench. There's the two trees. So he, this is in his visual memory. He always returns to these. To, there's the train, and there's this wonderful motif of the smoke coming through the trees, almost like it's on the, the far, these trees are on fire, but it's, it's literally this, the, the railroad line that runs across uh, the, the river here. And then he puts in little, little hints of uh, perspectives, these piers leading you uh, in, in, out into the, the space of the river. Of course, the boats, the, uh, the steamboats moving up and down, the piers, the, the, the very small figures involved uh, in different types of activity along the shoreline. And, um, and, and, and so this is, um, and this very high horizon line, again, with the Palisades um, at, the, at the top. And all, again, winter, all winter views. And this, the, the Palisades, the Palisades was also a very contemporary issue. Teddy Roosevelt was very concerned that it was being mined and destroyed and it, it became a site, a contested site, not unlike the, exca uh, the excavation of Penn Station, which you can imagine the controversy of living in the city at a time when that, you know, those, the, the explosions were rocking buildings near the site. But this was also a contested site. So Bellows is always aware of, of what literally what is in the news, what, what, is, what, is, um, what is new, what newspaper headlines. And, and the Palisades, even though they may not grab you as being, some, as being uh, modern like the excavation sites are, they're very much a, a kind of contested uh, modern um, uh, urban scape. And of course, they bridge beautifully as, as the excavation sites. They, they bridge, you would hardly know that this was New York. It's a kind of, it's a borderland, right? I mean, he's interested in this place where, um, you know, the edges of the city, the, the, the fringes of the city, where you have all of this strange activity packed into this narrow band and then reaching out across the river uh, to, to the Palisades. So there's an imaginative dimension to the way Bellows chooses these subjects. 
Um, and and, and in, a way, in, a, in a way, as beautiful as many of the paintings uh, in, in uh, Let It Snow are, I think, uh, and, and some of them are, are a relief after Bellows <laughs> because they're so serene and so beautiful, I think of the red field. But you know, as beautiful as they are, what we what we see, what again we can criticize Bellows. I, I try, I'm not trying to completely aggrandize him. I'm just trying to say that this was his, you know, this is what drove his art. This wild ambition. It was to do something extraordinary, something that uh, ha had a scope and a bigness, and 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 tackled the uh, realities of the day in a in a in a really remarkable way. Uh, and I and um, it's that it's hard to you know it's it's trying to recognize the scope of what's going on in his uh, painting that can often be uh, hard to articulate but but also hard to see. Um, and this is another view again, just a, a little in, in the sequence. It's more of a spring view, but you have all these interesting elements and variations. The train coming at you. This has more of a of a diagonal here, but the the there these kids playing baseball. But Bellows has his his figures alone are so fascinating because they're done. He was a, he had a car, almost a cartoonist. He did a lot of cartooning actually, but he has that ability to in a really a little calligraphic stroke convey posture, uh, the whole what what a body is doing, and so all of these little figures actually repay close attention. I think this is the picture, and they're, 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 I think there's a, a batter over here. But you can, you can start, and there's always these kind of stock, the, the, the street lamp and, and, um, and, the, and the boats. So again, and here are the trees again. These trees are often also like, like the elevated trains. They frame, they create a geometry within the picture that he's very aware of. So this, if you take a line up this tree, it actually create, you know, it creates a sense of the division of the space in almost geometric, a geometric way. Like this creates a kind of a different uh, rect, rect, uh, rectangle here that, that stabilizes the picture. So again, it gives him a freedom to, to organize the picture in really, really interesting ways too. This beautiful storm burst, uh, very dark painting. Again, this layering of space, coming storm uh, at the uh, Hirshhorn Museum. <coughs> very moody, and this um, incredible piece of painting at the top here. Rain on the river. I mean, wow. <laughs> I mean, this is so um, such a beautiful painting, and it, it's different. It's got a very strong diagonal, cutting, you know, creating space. Here's Riverside Park, you know, creating this pathway with just a, a single swoop of the brush. And again, this rem I mean, these are look at this piece of this is just a big chunk of yellow that he's just planted there, and somehow it activates the color in the rest of the painting. And these are the types of juxta raw juxtapositions of color that don't disrupt the reality of what you're seeing, but literally draw your attention to the, to the physical reality of the paint. Again, in some ways being analogous to like rock. You know, he, he's, these are, this, is a, this is like a, a writer or someone making connections that, um, that, that most of us can't make. You know, we can't articulate. Maybe I can. <laughs> I'm struggling to do myself, but it, it's that's what I love about Bellas. Is you, of course, with any great painter, you're always learning more than you can possibly uh, explicate because they're they know what they're doing. Um, again, look how the train boom, 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 four, four, four box cars. Um, the steam, you know, the challenge. Of, I mean, he clearly loved this notion of how smoke and steam disrupted the visual detail. And that's a complex thing to render. How do you how do you um, how do you get at that effect? And the and the beautiful um, you know the beautiful uh, here is a calm part of the picture. Of course, when he does these beautiful tonalist uh, grays and whites, it, it, there there is a restfulness uh, here in in in, in con uh, uh, contradiction or contrast to uh, what's going on um, in but in this. And and here you have the trees again. So it's, it's interesting if you, you can imagine, he seems to have that planted in his mind and he can do anything with these trees. And they're painted really interestingly. They've got little dabs of paint. So they're scraped often. His, his, the repertoire of how he 
uh, uses the palette knife, how he drags a dry brush through the paint. Um, you know, this is a total immersion in, in, the, um, in the art of painting, in the language of painting. And, and that's where you realize that this capacity that Bellows had of, of learning and absorbing and putting, putting everything um, into, into these paintings is, is, uh, is, is quite remarkable. And so here, here we have an episode. And I, again, very interesting episode. He goes to um, Zion, New Jersey. He goes, he leaves New York. So we've, we've left New York. Um, and he does um, this, he actually does plan, plein air painting. The plein air tradition was key, was a key uh, component of impressionist, the impressionist uh, painters revolution in the 19th century, getting out and painting directly from the motif. And this is what he does when he goes to Zion, New Jersey, uh, very early for a couple of weeks in, um, in 1909. And he's there with his roommate, Ed O'Keefe, who's also a painter. And guess his, uh, other, his other person along with him is Eugene O'Neill. He's at Eugene O'Neill's father's house. This is before Eugene O'Neill uh, has written his uh, uh, famous plays. Um, and, uh, and so, so the, it's a very interesting, interesting interlude. And it, it also points, his, his relationship with O'Neill points to something very serious about what Bellas is doing in this realist vein, in the same way that, that of course, uh, O'Neill's plays, long, long, uh, night, long, thank you, um, you know, the very serious psychological dramas that O'Neill goes on to make. But this time, he's, he's, he's still a poet. And apparently, the antidote is that he sits by the stove painting, uh, doing sonnets, bad sonnets, while, while, while Bellows and, and Keefe are out in the freezing cold painting, you know, painting in the snow. But, but you can see there is a bit, different, bit of a different quality with these works. You, you don't get the, the um, repetition of those um, motifs that we've been seeing again and again. And you get a sense of an actual, this is actually what he's seeing. Um, and that they correspond to real landscapes. There's still the wonderful paint, beautiful spatial recession, an, uh, you know, wonderful juxtaposition of color, of complementary colors, bl blues and oranges. Um, but it's, it's, a real, it's a real place. But they're, they're brilliant, right? They're wonderful. Uh, look at the color in this. I mean, uh, it's just, just fascinating. But, but again, I think he is, he's really painting directly, from, uh, directly out of doors with these. This is a startling work. Um, uh, and um, I begin, there's one, there's, I would draw your attention to Marsden Hartley's early work, which is being shown at 291 at the same time, Alfred Stieglitz's gallery in New York, where he's showing some of the more younger experimental painters. And we often divide these painters, like there's the Henry group, maybe often seen not as, as cutting edge as the Stieglitz, Alfred Stieglitz's more experimental gallery. But I'm sure this is a small world. They, they, I think a lot of these images show that he had, that Bellows was looking at these, these first images that Hartley shows in New York, just as Stieglitz discovers him. And it's, it's, it's a lot of snow scenes, mountain scenes, and they're very expressionistic. They're about conveying a feeling, which ultimately is what Bellows' painting is about. It ultimately is expressionistic, and it ties his work uh, to these expressionistic veins uh, in American art in the early 20th century. This is very unusual in that he's finally confined himself to a, to, a, you know, to a comprehensible piece of the landscape here. Again, so interesting though in the, in the, blue, uh, the blues and oranges um, and, and, and the vitality of the way the paints apply it. But this is, this is, a, is, a, is a, almost an anomaly where you, you don't feel like you're, you're surveying a, a, huge, a vast uh, space. The winter in Zion at the Lehigh University Art Galleries. Um, Again, we, we, this, this seems like a very specific uh, space, um, a very, with the this, with this stone wall uh, defining this lane covered, in, of course, in the snow. Incredible. He has that genius that so many, his, his heroes were uh, Homer, Whistler, Aikens, but that genius of, uh, that all, I think, all great painters of describing and seemingly minute detail with the, with the most economical of means, this type of landscape. I mean, that, you know, um, Homer can do, if you know Homer's watercolors, he, he can do a whole field with just one tone and, and, the, and the texture of the paper. And you feel like the whole, everything is there. And, and, and Bellows, again, has that deft touch, I think, in conveying uh, the complexity of this landscape uh, viewed through the trees. 
And this is very, very akin to Hartley's work. It's um, if, from this time. Uh, again, I think a, a real view, but it's, it's very aggressively patterned here with this, this zigzag uh, a pattern um, and a very striking work. But this again is he's painting a lot of, he's painting like 30 of these in two weeks. So he's, uh, he's um, and so now we get, I, I hope I'm not, I'm getting, uh, this is a bit of a ramble. I hope it's not getting too um, drawn out. But this is, we're at, we're at our final, we're at the home stretch here. Um, and this is, I'm calling Winter on the River. This is the second part where, uh, which takes you to the end of this series. So the series spans from essentially 1907 to 1915, which is a big part of Bella's career because it was so, it was shortened by his premature death. But here um, we have um, this really lovely, powerful um, winter scene. Let me just catch, catch up here. So, um, yeah, I mean, just gorgeous. And this is where he becomes much more engaged with, with very, you know, the color gets very heightened. And, and this is probably where he's really starting to absorb these issues of color theory from uh, Hardesti Murata. Uh, another uh, very important person for him is Denman Ross, who, who prescribes these very elaborate palettes um, and ways of bringing out color. But, but you, you have, again, the, oops, this is, so that's what I'll, um, but here's the, uh, the, the pair of people walking down the path, um, the tree, but, but here it really is this really vibrant blue and orange combination that makes this color just, and the, and the white of the snows just like leap off the, uh, the canvas. And these, these are examples again of the type of complex color systems that he's interested in. Murata, uh, um, he patented these, these color charts, these diagrams for mixing paint, these are the Denman uh, palettes, how to organize your palette, um, and very elaborate. And, but, but Murata ends up with this, this theory, which is very, you know, there's lots of theories relating music to, co uh, to, 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 to color. And he called this his color keyboard. Uh, and actually, Bellows went on to develop his own palette of 133 tins that created, that replicated some of these complex um, color systems that he could use outdoors. He, he said he should have patented it, but it was this massive thing with 133 little tins that essentially, uh, I, I, uh, he was very invested in these systems and he was invested in compositional systems, um, uh, especially later in life that, that, that shows his kind of intellectual engagement with, with theories of, of, of color theories and compositional theories. But I, I, would, I would be hard pressed because I'm not, I can't follow it. I, I, it's, hard, it's, it's very difficult to follow how those theories relate specifically uh, to paintings. The, uh, again, the Palisades, um, all the uh, same, um, a lot of the same motifs we've been seeing um, again and again. Um, and again, but, a, but more heightened color. Um, you, you have, now this is a funny little, look at this bench. You see, he's got, it's like, what, what is that? It's like he's taken this motif of the bench and it's literally sideways. It's almost like he doesn't care that it's, a, it's he's just using it as a, as a device to kind of create a new, like these stripes against the snow. But here's the, the people in top hats walking, another bench here, the, 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 the train uh, coming along the seashore. Uh, so again, back, in, back again and again to, this, uh, to these same uh, motifs. And this is the, um, uh, the Blackwell's, um, this shows the Blackwell's um, island, which um, this bridge crosses over, which is the Queensboro Bridge. And this was later called Welfare Island, and now it's called Roosevelt Island. Uh, it was a marginal space. Again, these very interesting um, spaces that he's interested in, in these, um, places where lots of different things overlap. It was the site of an almshouse, a workhouse, and a penitentiary. Um, and it, this bridge crossed over it. 
And, but Bella is rather, again, like the Pennsylvania Station, rather focused, focusing attention on the heroic bridge, really focuses obliquely on, on the, under, you know, the underclasses and the, and the plight of, of, the, of, these, of these peoples in, in the, um, the people that are consigned to the almshouse, the workhouse, the penitentiary. So the forgotten average, uh, the forgotten everyday person um, is, is most often Bella's uh, point of attention. And so, um, and, and this gives you a sense of here is Welfare Island and here's the, uh, the bridge or Blackwell's Island and, and crossing different names over different eras. And this is the gallery's lone tenement. And again, this is a scene of the, great, of the bridge crossing, uh, crossing over, but he hardly shows any of the bridge. Instead, he, he focuses on these wraith-like figures uh, in front of this tenement. And we know that this whole area was raised for the building of this bridge. And again, we have the steamer. We have the, uh, we have the river. We have, so this is, he's folding all of these things. We have the two trees, this motif recurring. Um, and then we have these kind of wraith-like figures, homeless figures displaced by the building of this bridge. We have the, car the horses in the carriage here. Um, and we have this, um, so, and I think what's happened here is that Bellows has telescoped something, uh, the lone tenement that was farther away from the bridge and brought it right into the, into the picture. And this was a motif that Hopper picks up on. Hopper also, this, this, uh, the kind of vestiges of, uh, of these uh, tenement buildings uh, overshadowed and displaced by these monumental public works projects. But here again, you have these incredible swaths of pure paint, this orange red that just slathered on there. This palette is so extraordinary and so beautiful. Um, again, in the, in, uh, juxtaposed to this rather forlorn, uh, a desperate scene of people in winter gathered around a fire, um, and and again it, it it echoes it echoes with that sense that you get in the excavation pictures of something literally raised to the ground, uh, uh, and and kind of uh, almost a race erasing human presence, but um, fa I mean this is one of his his uh, most fascinating uh, pictures. So this kind of bridges the urban worlds and the river uh, views. And now we start getting into some of these really very pure uh, snow pictures. Um, we, you, uh, this is almost, a, you're getting to something that's almost pure white. But again, you have the, the, the boy and his father, the person clearing snow, the bench. The, uh, the, you can't even see the train in this one. It's just, it's just suggested by the smoke. And this is the, uh, the street lamp, of course, um, and the docks. But this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is white on white. I mean, this is beautiful um, articulation of this uh, challenge of white on white painting. So, let's see. And then floating ice. I mean, we're almost right, just completely in, uh, absorbed by the, the, the depiction of ice. Um, it, we're right on the edge. Uh, we're not getting too much. Act we still have the bench and the figures, the two figures here. But th this, this is getting to be almost pure paint. It, it's, 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 a, it's almost it's so flattened and so um, pushed to the front of the uh, picture plane that, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's almost a pure abstraction. Blue Morning, the battery, this takes you down to Lower Manhattan. It's one of these great orchestrations of, of, of blue paintings that Bellas did. It has, it, and this is close, this is probably the calmest work he did. It's a little bit more akin to some of the other images you see in the show. It, it's not overpowering in terms of the activity. It has huge expanses of kind of a piece, it's more of a peaceful scene uh, near the bottom of the city. And nonetheless, it's got a lot going on. These are horses that clear snow in the city going to this shed. Wonderful group, the, the pairing here. Um, but it, it, it had, because of that overall blue cast, it has a certain harmony and peacefulness that uh, is extraordinary. And this is very, of course, this I think is in many ways is the harshest of the paintings. Um, it really conveys in a completely visceral sense the misery of these horses. 
and the, and the kind of the the sleet. It's almost like, like a, you could probably you could probably this is a sleet. This is almost like a freezing rain that um, again co completely gray white, almost a white out. Uh, and these and the and the the uh, the kind of visceral feeling of the of these animals and men um, working along the shore of the river. That that this painting really does make you shiver. I think a little bit. <laughs> And this, I mean, again, these, these are all one, one more fabulous than the next. Uh, it's a, a, an, um, again, just to reiterate, his, this is a quote. His sketches are made with notebook and pencil, but which he seldom uses in painting the picture. So graphically is it photographed on his memory. And then, too, while he paints parts of the city, he generalizes it so that there will not be a localization. For instance, his palisades are not of any one spot on the Hudson, but might be any place. This is, of course, snow-capped river from the Telfair Art Museum. This is almost like a cake. It's so rich, and it's, 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 it's just layer after layer after layer after layer after layer with these, with, there's a lot, obviously, again, I, I apologize, I'm kind of running through these, but I, I hope, I'm just, uh, you, the, the, the details about how he's painting the river, the ice forming, areas that are, are still uh, flowing, areas that are iced over, areas that are becoming ice. I mean, he really, he, again, he's very invested in that, um, as, he, as, the, as the title of the talk, getting hold of something real. Um, making that, you know, making that translation from, from substance uh, of ice and snow into, into paint. Um, and it's, it's a kind of, a, it's, it's, a real, it's a real feat. This has this incident, a little incident with the dogs here, people uh, dressed up. But uh, again, these little anecdotal uh, aspects of it are interesting also. And this again is one of these raw scenes of these poor, these, these guys that are actually picking up the snow throughout the city, putting it into these carts, and then dumping it in, in the East River with the Brooklyn Bridge here. So you get, the, again, the recurrence of the, of the, of the teams of horses, um, this one almost in, 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 interesting, almost totally in shadow. But the, there's also the heroic quality of this picture. The, the figures are bigger than in most of the pictures. And it's really, it's really celebrating the bravery, the skill of these people who have to clear the streets. And it has a very stable triangular structure uh, from, that you see that comes down through here and through here. Uh, as, as well as these uh, horizontal divisions. It's beautifully, uh, beautifully um, composed. This was cut down from a bigger picture. They're very, uh, very lovely picture. And now we're getting close to the, this is a more domestic scene of a yard and, and the gentleman uh, and an unusual uh, color here in terms of painting these trees. This is this is one of this is almost the, this uh, summary picture where he's really throwing everything into the into the scene the ocean liner the, the these men looking for work these dock workers they come and they're looking for work the river's frozen that might be uh, so there's there's the plight of these men uh, all of these uh, on the shore also and of course framed by the the city itself. And the opposite, very opposite, from the working class to the privileged classes playing in the snow. And this is really what, a picture that celebrates this other side of snow, of, 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 of snow this, this playing in the snow, enjoying the snow. Uh, and it has this wonderful effect of these groups of skaters moving along uh, and these larger figures dressed in their finery uh, in, the, in the foreground. We don't know, this is a, unusual in that there's no river view here. We don't quite, this is complete, no one has figured out what this is referring to. There's some thought that it might have actually been painted uh, on the Palisade side of the, uh, of the Hudson. And this gets us to the top of uh, the Hudson where it turns, and this is probably where this picture is situated, uh, Easter, Easter Snow, which, which is the last of this, this extraordinary, uh, extraordinary series. Um, and um, you, you have, um, this extraordinary, look at the color in this tree. It's, it's a, so he's, again, this goes back to what, what he's doing with all these motifs. They get more and more involved, more interesting. Um, 
and there's there's interesting interactions here between some of these. I'm sorry about this, but between um, a lot of these figures and very well, it, it's, it recedes beautifully into space uh, and opens up into this wide vista. Easter Easter snow. It's it's of course it's it's trying to capture that unexpected snow late in the season in, in spring. So it's capturing you know people that are not dressed uh, appropriately. Um, and uh, so it's, it's attending to some very specific, uh, the, one of the critics said, all through this sunny, snowy scene, church paraders gingerly picking their way along the shoveled paths and young New York sporting among the white reaches a parkway that sloped to the cold river. He has worked the exhilarating quality of touch and design. So here we are. <laughs> this, is, this is the conclusion. Uh, and thank you for your patience. It's a, it was, it's a long, complicated uh, series of paintings. Um, so Bellows encompassed both the enormous scale and transient qualities of the modern metrop metropolis. His series of winter scenes tied the dyna dynamic power and industry of New York to the limitless, limitless forces of nature that girded and underlay the modern island city. In attempting to understand Bella's achievement, it is important to bear in mind that in his all-encompassing ambition, whether his subject was boxing or war or winter in the city, he was always trying to plumb the depths, unfathomable depths of experience. Bella's proclaimed this on numerous occasions. Quote, I am always very amused with people who talk about lack of subjects for painting. The great difficulty is that you cannot stop to sort them out. First of all, I am a painter, and a painter gets hold of life, gets hold of something real, of many real things. That makes him think, and if he thinks out loud, he is called a revolutionist. I have always felt about art that it was freedom that counted. A man must see things and say things in his own way. Try everything that can be done. Try it in every possible way. Be deliberate, be spontaneous, be thoughtful and painstaking. Be abandoned and impulsive. Learn your own possibilities. There is nothing I do not want to know that has to do with life or art. And that's what you're seeing at play in these paintings. Finally, a work of art can be any imaginable thing, and this is the beginning of modern painting. So all of these variations you're seeing in these paintings is, is him reimagining again and again this obsession uh, with life. In 1925, the leading proponent of literary naturalism, the year Bellows died, Theodore Dreiser, wrote of Bellows' urban views, pushing and moving and seeking, like clouds, like smoke. What will be, will be. Instinctively and truly, he senses the now. Mr. Bellows, with his palette and brush and a piece of canvas, evokes it all out of inner intuition, which is deeper and finer than all the schools and all such crowds as these. By contrast, they are mere shadows, flotsam and jetsam on the tides of time. When Bellows died in New York on January 8, 1925, six days after his appendix ruptured, his passing unleashed tremendous grief and sorrow in New York art circles. Hopper's neighbor, the artist Walter Tittle, remembered Quote, Hopper came through the door that connected our studios in Washington Square. Tears were streaming down his face. He came to tell me that Bellows was dead. Joe Hopper recalled the atmosphere at Bellows' funeral at the Church of the Ascension. It was all the most grief-stricken community. Such sad men followed the coffin down the aisle. Everybody there, Henry weeping wretchedly. A decade later, the protean writer Thomas Wolfe expressed what had driven a creative individual like Bellows to place art at the center of life itself in, in Wolfe's novel of Time and the River. At that instant, he saw in one blaze of light an image of unutterable conviction. The reason why the artist works and lives and has his being, the reward he seeks, 
the only reward he really cares about, without which there is nothing, it is to snare the spirits of mankind in nets of magic, to make his life prevail through his creation, to wreck the vision of his life, the rude and painful substance of his own experience, into the congruence of blazing and enchanted images that are themselves the core of life, the essential pattern whence all other things proceed, the kernel of eternity. And finally, shortly after Bellows died, the great American writer Sherwood Anderson wrote, Bellows' paintings keep telling you things. They are telling you that Mr. Bellows died too young. They are telling you that he was after something, that he was always after it. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions. <laughs> he went over across the river, the Hudson River, but did he go up as far as Nyack? Or was it mostly Jersey? It was Zion, which I understand is near Princeton. It's not that far from Princeton. But he was but he, by the he, Palisades. Absolutely, and he painted in Maine, of course. There, there are a, a huge amount of works from Maine, Monhegan. Um, so he spent a lot of hundreds of works that he did in Maine, also, but not not that I know of um, near New York, other than Zion. So. Would you like to ask questions? Anything else? Um, what? Did they ever make um, note cards of some of these paintings? <laughs> Oh. Absolutely. They're, they're, they, I hope the one of the, uh, of, the, of the steaming streets is here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we do have that in the store, so uh, no, no, no problems there. Are there any other questions? Yes? Sure, George. His, where, the question is, where are his sketchbooks? And they don't exist. His, his paintings have all been cataloged. His lithographs, which are remarkable, have all been cataloged. But the mystery of Bellows is someone needs to really ca uh, catalog all of his drawings. But I think th the disconnect is because they're really not directly connected to the paintings. But it's a really interesting question. It's, the, it's the, really the, the last uh, big part of, of Bellows' work that we need to learn more about. Um, but um, it's, it's fascinating to see that there really are not complex, detailed studies for these paintings, which just reaffirms this notion of how he's working from memory uh, directly. You use the word series a lot. Does that just mean that you're grouping them together, or was he consciously thinking of these as, as a series? I think they, he was not saying uh, excavation one, excavation two, excavation three, excavation four. So in that sense, no. But of course, we can see these repetitions. Again, you know, him revisiting a theme over and over and over. So in that sense, they, 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 they are series. Uh, and, um, and that's one way. I think the notion, again, of the series, that this is something that does relate to modern painting, that there's never a definitive version. You, move, you keep moving through iterations because you're uh, there's never, it never ends. I mean, these are con variations on a theme. So you see that working out in, in Bellows, uh, that, that very modern idea that there, there isn't a single reality that can be captured and summarized in one grand painting. It's, a, it's this constant churning uh, 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 and aspiring to uh, accomplish something because reality is too ephemeral, it's too volatile. You, you, you come up with strategies for trying to capture it knowing that you won't you can't succeed. Do you have any, do you have any sense of the sequence uh, in which an individual painting was, was uh, composed? Like, did he have huge textures of the snow and the rivers and then, then fill in details at the front? Or did he put a scene together and then put smoke in? trains had any any sense of I think there's the, the he talked about a tickler <laughs> which was a brush which was a brush where he would go in and do do a lot of the little fine work over the, these big swaths of paint 
Um, so there is some sense of him, you know, working broadly and then going in, uh, which is not unusual, and filling in some of these details of figures. Uh, 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 but but I, I think um, my sense of it is that it's all pretty directly worked. I mean, if you actually, there's the evidence of him putting, which is part of the, the idea that it, when you're marking that canvas, you're, you're, you're marking a, a, a time, a, a moment that's connected to, you know, the actual experience itself. So there's something, for Bellows, I think it's, um, it's like um, his paintings are always analogous to the activity that he's showing you. So w with his boxing pictures, you feel that he's, he's literally confronting and, and gesturing as though he were in the ring with, instead of a, a boxing glove, it's a paintbrush. Because it's, you know, it's fractured, it's, it's, it's momentary. And, and so I think he's really trying to create a connection between the act of painting and the, and the action that he's seeing. And in this way, Bellows really is an action painter. He's someone that really wants to create, to, to, to create a, a vocabulary of painting as being itself an action, mm -hmm. an act, uh, which is, becomes to fruition in, in mid-century with artists like Jackson Pollock, who is you know, literally making art out of gestures. And how about, how, about that, how about New York, the painting New York? Do you get the sense that, that it's moving from you right, right in front of you up into the buildings, or are the buildings spilling all of those That's people? That's an incredible, and yeah. This is something, um, it, it really is hard to tell. It's hard, there, there's something, um, there, uh, this is, seems to me to be a painting that's almost inspired. There, there are certain paintings that uh, I'll just, uh, for, if you ever see The Tree of Life by Joseph Stella, uh, or, you know, there's paintings that seem to almost literally be done in a, in a trance, um, where if you, if, you, if you stop to try to think, think about um, how they organize something so complex, you might say, oh, well, it's like a stained glass, you know, but it's, you know, he's just doing piece by piece. But there's so much going on here, and the fact that it, it out of this total chaos appears this very, crisp, very specific type of order, you know, that is a kind of a gift. And, um, and that's where, um, you know, that's really what um, makes, that's the art of painting, you know, that's like, why, why do we, that's why we love, love the art form, because people like Bellows know how to literally take, you know, f reach the potential of what paint can do on canvas, what it can represent, the types of, the whole variety of gestures, the way you can build a painting. Um, and, and so um, this is a, is a, is a really um, a painting that is becoming, getting more, has gotten more and more attention. It's, it's a painting that, that I think at the gallery and is, you know, I think it's endlessly, endlessly fascinating and it's meant to be. So I, I, I would be hard pressed to, I think, uh, we probably should, we can try, we haven't really answered that question, but I think it would be, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to answer. We could, but it's, it'd be interesting to try. I'm going to stop you there because I think you earned your supper for sure. Uh, and um, I, I also wanted to give you an opportunity if you would like to uh, have a signed copy of one of uh, Charlie's books. He's going to uh, go to the museum store and sit there and sign. So uh, join us over there if you're interested. And otherwise, thank you so much for attending the lecture. And have a good evening.